on Compton. These developments would, in time, make St. Lucian's masters of their own destiny. But one thing was missing. To be able to chart out for themselves their own courses of development, the people of this country had to be independent. Up until 1978, St. Lucia could legally control only its internal affairs, while Britain remained responsible for external affairs and defense. Agriculture and tourism continued to sustain the island's economy, but these economic activities were tied to the external affairs of the island, which Britain controlled. Premier John Compton was determined to give control of St. Lucia to St. Lucians, and in 1978, he led the island on the crusade towards independence. While the government was preparing the people for their new status, the opposition St. Lucia Labour Party, led by Alan Luisi, held public demonstrations in Viewfort and the city of Castries against the granting of independence to St. Lucia by the British government. Another part of the preparations for independence was several rounds of constitutional talks in London which were attended by the government led by Premier John Compton and the opposition led by Alan Luisi. In London, the Minister of State in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ted Rowlands, welcomed Mr. Compton and Mr. Luisi, George Odlam and Peter Josie. This meeting was held at Marlborough House. The government team also included Parry Husbands, Dr. Claudius Thomas and Henry Girodi. The SLP's team included George Odlam, Evans Cauldron and Peter Josie. The British government's team was led by Ted Rowlands. And at the end of the talks, Premier Compton expressed the wish that the difference between government and the opposition would be resolved. We have spent four days modeling the new framework within which the people of St. Lucia will soon begin to conduct their own affairs as a free and sovereign people. We have arrived at substantial agreement on the nature of that new framework and the narrow margins of difference between my delegation and the delegation representing the opposition will, I have no doubt, be readily resolved in the House of Assembly in St. Lucia. Without the goodwill that has prevailed, the success that has attended this conference would not have been possible. We know that, on your part, sir, that goodwill will continue to prevail. And while we aware that the impending recess of your parliament and the conditions that may obtain after it reconvenes will crucially affect the timing of St. Lucia's transition, we know that you will bend every effort, as you've assured us, to clear the way to permit the people of St. Lucia to enter into sovereign nationhood on their national day, December 13, 1978. And Mr. Luisi, for his part, told the conference of his wish for basic protection in the new constitution for the people of St. Lucia. It is clear that the policy of the British government is to grant independence to Associated States as soon as is reasonably practicable. But even in achieving desirable goals, it is vital that the method of achieving these goals are plausible, legitimate, and that guiding principles are adhered to. In the course of the conference, my delegation has ins insisted on some basic provisions for the protection of the people. Some were accepted, but others were rejected. We will endeavor, however, to draw such provisions to the attention of the people at St. Lucia in the months that lie ahead. And the British Minister, Ted Rowlands, also gave his views on the outcome of the conference. The constitution which has emerged is a very good one. As I said at the beginning of the conference, the constitution cannot guarantee a democracy. Only the political will of people can ensure uh, that, work, that real democracy survives. But a constitution can provide an, uh, a framework for and a buttress of a democratic system. This conference, I think, has ensured that. We've devoted considerable time on the chapter, on, to the chapter on protection for rights and freedoms of the individual. We've also ensured in this constitution the maintenance of the rule of law. 
I think we also mustn't underestimate the amount of real significant change which has been both proposed and accepted to the original draft constitution from which we started. They are a tribute, in my view, to uh, the very constructive approach of the opposition at this conference and to the spirit of compromise conducted by the Premier and, 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 and his delegation. As the talks ended, Mr. Compton, speaking to newsmen, described the talks as successful. I think it was successful beyond our expectation. In fact, the conference was scheduled to take five days because we expected a lot of grim opposition. It lasted uh, only three days of working sessions, and the fourth day was taken up by, for the final report. As the news of the outcome of the talks reached home, St. Lucians from all walks of life made their way to Heronora International Airport at Beaufort to salute Premier Compton, whom they had dubbed the father of the nation. SLP supporters were also at the airport, not to meet their leader, but to register their protest. And then came December 14th, 1978. The news out of London that day was that the House of Lords had passed the St. Lucia Termination of Association Order, thus paving the way for an independent St. Lucia on February 22nd, 1979. Here is Alva Clark in London with the good news. Uh, the House of Lords approved the draft order of the St. Lucia Termination uh, of Association uh, and in a short half-hour debate, uh, all the Lords wished St. Lucia well uh, in the independence uh, in February. Uh, the order was uh, introduced on behalf of the government by Lord Boronry Roberts, who is the Minister of State at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. It was welcomed by the Conservative Party, uh, that's the opposition, by Lord Elton, and on behalf of the Liberal Party by Lord McNair. Uh, and a number of Lords spoke in a debate that only lasted uh, half an hour. It wasn't a debate in that sense. With just two months to go, all systems were working in full swing, transforming the House of Assembly. And the city of Castries took on a new London-like look. With preparations finally at an end, and just two more days to go, Premier Compton was on radio and television addressing St. Lucians after the police had used tear gas on striking public servants. Mr. Compton said, I had not intended to speak to you again until I make my address of acceptance of the new constitution on February the 22nd at the flag raising ceremony. But certain matters have now come to hand, which I think is important for me to discuss with you and to bring you up to date with the situation. All of us who live in St. Lucia know that for several years now, since we indicated that it was the government's intention to seek independence for St. Lucia, Certain elements in our society who have been very vocal have been trying to frustrate or at least to delay St. Lucia's march to freedom. They've tried everything. They've tried delaying tactics and procrastination. They've tried intimidation. intimidation. They've resorted to violence. And all these things have failed. Our country, like any mother, is going through the pains of birth. But when her labors are over, we all shall rejoice at the birth of our nation. We shall continue steadfastly along the path we have chosen.
Soon after this address, it was over to Viji Airport to welcome to St. Lucia Her Royal Highness Princess Alexandra, Her Majesty the Queen's representative at our independence celebrations. And with just one day to go, Premier Compton said that St. Lucia was looking forward to using its independence as a tool for our development. We're not going to be involved in the politics of the world. I think we're much too small to play any significant role. But we are looking forward to use our independence as a tool for our own economic development. And I believe that is the role that we think look for ourselves. And so, at midnight on February 21st, the British flag was lowered for the last time, and in its place was the flag of a new sovereign state. Thus, after 176 years of uninterrupted British rule, St. Lucians became responsible for their own country and destiny. On February 22nd, 1979, the island's first Prime Minister, John Compton, took the oath of office, along with Mrs. Haroldin Rock, the first Lady Cabinet Minister, and Mr. Parry Husbands, the first Attorney General to be appointed. Mr. Vincent Flosak was sworn in as the first President of the Senate. I, Vincent Frederick Flosak, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors, according to law. So help me God. With the celebrations of independence now over, St. Lucians began to prepare for general elections. election of 1979 was held on July 2nd. The elections were presided over by election of 1979 was held on July 2nd. The elections were presided over by protracted labor disputes involving civil servants and teachers. These disputes were seen as politically motivated and some public servants refused leadership in striking against the government. By the time voting took place, the contest had shaped up as a two-party battle with no independent candidates involved. For the ruling United Workers Party, UWP, all incumbents sought re-election except Dr. Vincent Monroe's. As a condition of a new independence in Lucia, a new voting list was prepared with 67,917 names, a 70% increase over that of 1974. And on that July night, the UWP, after 15 years in office, were voted out in a 12 to 5 victory for the SLP. Although the percentage turnout was down from 1974, there was nearly 40% more ballots cast in 1979. Despite the magnitude of the SLP victory, UWP candidates actually polled more than 2,000 votes in excess of the 1974 total. Following the election, Prime Minister Luizzi and all of the victorious members of his party traveled to Government House for a swearing-in ceremony. Peter Josie, Winston Snag, Evan Scaldron, Michael Pilgrim, Bruce Williams, John Odlam, Kenneth Foster, Remy Lesmo, Gregor Mason. Not long after this, Mr. Luizzi was asking Governor General Sir Alan Lewis to leave Government House and one-time secretary of the SLP, Boswell Williams, was appointed Governor-General. The leadership struggle within the government began. This struggle was as a result of an agreement which would install Alan Luizzi as Prime Minister with the understanding that he would retire as Prime Minister by a specific date, handing over the office to George Odlam. 
But when the agreed upon time for the transfer of power arrived, Louisi hedged and intra party battle began. Mr. Louisi resigned, and Mr. Winston Snack, who was a member of Louisi's cabinet and had himself resigned as Attorney General, replaced Louisi as Prime Minister. This move led to the departure of the two Odlums and Mikey Pilgrim from the cabinet. Peter Josie then became Mr. Snack's deputy. This new move did not last, and the Snack led government collapsed with his resignation in January of 1982. The Honorable John Compton, the Honorable George Odlum, and I have reached an agreement which is a matter of history, not only for St. Lucia, but I, I should say for the West Indies. We have agreed to, to have a national government, a government of national unity, and elections will be held not later than the 31st of July, 1982, this year, that is to say, and I will, in the interest of the country, in the interest and benefit of the people of St. Lucia, having regard to the various crises we've been through within the last two years, I have decided to step down as Prime Minister, and it is agreed by my colleagues, and we must refer to them now as colleagues, because we are working together as one. It is agreed by my colleagues that I will have the right to nominate four persons four seats in the cabinet. Mr. Odlum will have the right to nominate one person. Mr. Compton will have the right to nominate three persons. And uh, Mr. Mr. Mikey Pilgrim, who Mr. Odlum has in identified as his nominee, will be the Prime Minister. Mr. Michael Pilgrim, the new interim Prime Minister, headed the interim government and fresh general elections were held in May of 1982. For the first time, St. Lucia had three parties to choose from, each with a full slate of candidates. The result was a resounding victory for the UWP, which won 56% of the votes and 14 seats in the House of Assembly. Two went to the Labour Party, SLP, and one to the PLP. During the elections campaign, Clarence Rambali, who was Speaker in the House of Assembly during the SLP administration, ran on a UWP ticket to beat George Odlum. The new administration of John Compton, on returning to office, set about consulting St. Lucians on a national plan. But why a national plan? A nation needs a plan as a ship needs a compass. We want to know where we are at any point in time, where we want to go, and how we shall get there. As a nation, we need to know what we have, what the tools available for us in the employment for our development. What are our present resources? What are the prospects of supplementing these resources? And how best we shall employ these resources to obtain the maximum benefit, to give our people a better and fuller life. In short, an inventory of our resources tells us where we are at any point in time. Thus, we need to decide, not merely as a government, but as a people, where we want to go, what direction our nation should take to achieve the goals we have set before us, what resources we should employ in every sector of the economy, to achieve these goals. For instance, if we want to get to Vierfort, we should decide whether we want to take the road via Soufre or the road via Denry. Similarly, if we want to achieve the maximum economic growth, we must first know how much money we have and how much we would allocate, for instance, to agriculture, to education, to tourism, to industry, in this day and age, this age of science and technology, we must decide what direction we should guide our children. Should we develop the field of science and technology, 
or should we continue as we've been doing in arts and general sciences? In agriculture, what are the markets available? And therefore, what crops we should produce? And how best we should produce them? And in what area of St. Lucia can these crops be best produced?